Hi everyone, welcome to our video lecture for section 12.3 on calculus in polar coordinates. In this video lecture, we're going to be going over how to find the slope of a tangent line to a polar graph, how to find points of intersections for polar curves, then we're going to be determining the area of a region bounded by a polar graph, then we'll take a look at slightly more complicated problems on determining the area between polar curves, and lastly, we'll finish by determining the arc length for polar curves. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and begin here with our first definitions. How can we find derivatives in polar coordinates? Now, before we go over the definitions here, I want you to remember a couple of things that whenever we were dealing with a polar function, we define r in terms of theta. So we're treating here basically r as a function of theta. Now, I also want you guys to remember that whenever we were going from polar to Cartesian, we defined x as r times cosine of theta and y times sine of theta. And lastly, the final thing to remember is parametric equations, because that's going to be the key. All right, so to find a tangent line to a polar curve r equals to f of theta, we will be treating theta as a parameter. Now, since we know that x is the same thing as r cosine theta and y the same thing as r sine theta, well, we can also treat x here as some function of theta times cosine theta and y as some function of theta times sine of theta. Although a lot of the times so I'm just going to keep on using r. Now, if this holds true, then the derivative dy dx will be the following, dy d theta over dx d theta. Now, where are we getting this equation? Well, recall that in section 12.1, we define dy dx as dy dt over dx dt, where the y and the x were functions of the parameter t. And again, this could be proved with a chain rule. All right, so with this in mind, let's go back to our equations in polar. Since we know that y and x are functions of theta, then when we're taking that derivative here, we will need the product rule. And that's how we're going to be obtaining this formula here. Starting with the function y, again, it's a function of theta, and r being also a function of theta, then the product rule says that, okay, it's going to be the derivative of the first, so that's how we have the dr d theta, times the second function, sine theta, plus now the first function times the derivative of the second function, and the derivative of sine theta is cosine theta. So that's how we obtain our numerator. Now for the denominator, it's going to be the same thing. We have dx d theta. Well, x here is a function of theta, where the r and, well, the angle cosine is a function of theta. So it's going to be the derivative of the first function, dr d theta, times the second function, minus the first function times the derivative of the second. Sorry, plus the derivative of the second. But in this case, we're dealing with a cosine, and the derivative of a cosine is a negative sine. So that's how we obtain our denominator here. So this formula here, guys, I would recommend you guys memorize it. Although you don't really have to, you can just go ahead and simply remember that dy d theta over dx d theta, and then just go ahead and use the product rule to obtain the formula. It can save time if you memorize it, but you don't have to. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and put this formulas in action. Let's go ahead and begin with example one here, where we have the following. Let r equals to two times one minus sine theta, defined here only when theta is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to two pi. Okay, so for this one here, I want you to begin by sketching the graph in our calculator just to get a sense of what it is. Now, if you remember plotting some polar coordinates or some functions in polar, you might be already a little bit familiar with what this function is gonna be, but if not, that's okay, we have our calculator here. Okay, so here I have my calculator. Now, before I start using it, I gotta make sure that in mode, it is indeed marked in polar so I can graph it. So making sure now that it's in polar, I'm just gonna go to y equals two and our function is gonna be two times one minus sine theta. There we go. So I'm gonna graph it here. Okay, so it looks like we have a cardioid. Now I don't like the window scaling too much, so I'm just gonna click here on zoom, click on zoom fit all the way down to essentially the zero option. There we go, zoom fit, there we go. Much better looking cardioid here. All right, now in this one here, I'm not gonna ask you to sketch the graph in paper, but I do want you guys to be familiar with the type of shapes they were getting. Okay, now the first thing that I want to do here is express both the x and the y variables as functions of theta. So let's go ahead and begin with the x here. Now we know that x is the same thing as r cosine theta. So now I'm just gonna go ahead and plug in the r. So we're gonna get two minus two sine theta times cosine theta. Now notice here that I distributed two. All right, so simplifying this a little bit more, we're gonna get x is the same thing as two cosine theta minus two sine theta cosine theta. Now at this point you might be remembering or you might be recognizing that 
if we have 2 sine theta cosine theta, we could rewrite this one here as 2, oh, I'm sorry, sine of 2 theta. Now, will I ask you guys to do this? It depends on the problem. Some problems could be simplified if you remember your trig identities, but for this one here, I don't think it's going to matter too much. So I'll just leave it as 2 cosine theta minus 2 sine theta cosine theta. All right, now taking a look at the y, we know that the y variable is the same thing as r times sine theta. So this is going to give us now 2 minus 2 sine theta times sine theta, which can simplify to 2 sine theta minus 2 sine squared theta. All righty. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the next part. Now for the next part, now we actually want to figure out, okay, well, what is going to be dy d theta and what will be dx d theta? So let's go ahead and begin here with our dy d theta. Now at this point, uh, what we can do is just go ahead and take a look at our y functions in terms of theta and then find the derivative. Doing this is going to give us, let's see, so 2 sine theta, the derivative should be 2 cosine theta minus the derivative of 2 sine squared theta, which should give us here a 4 times sine theta cosine theta. Okay, now perfect. Now for our dx d theta, taking the derivative of x with respect to theta, we should be getting, now the derivative of cosine is a negative sine, so we should be getting a negative 2 sine theta minus, now at this point here we can decide, we can either take the derivative of 2 sine theta cosine theta, which will require us to use a product rule, or alternatively, we could use a trig identity that, oh, well, 2 sine theta cosine theta was the same thing as sine 2 theta, and I'm going to take the derivative of that, because that seems easier. So the derivative of sine of 2 theta is going to be a negative, well, the negative is included, so it's going to be now a cosine of 2 theta times 2. Okay, perfect. Now, before I go ahead and apply, well, use this derivative to figure out dy dx, I want to remind you again that I use this approach right now uh, where we first identified, okay, what was the y and the x in terms of theta, and then took the derivative directly. However, if you choose to go ahead and use the formulas that we described above here, where dy d theta was the same thing as dr d theta times sine theta plus r cosine theta, if we use that approach, I'll show you what I got here. So I got these equations here for dy d theta and dx d theta. Now notice here it was a longer process, so whenever you can, I do encourage you guys to just go ahead and rewrite the variables in terms of theta and then take the derivative rather than simply using the formula. Because, well, it's a little bit longer because you do need to simplify a couple more things. But the end result here is the same, or dy d theta, right here, is the same thing as 2 times cosine of theta minus 2 sine theta cosine theta. And that dx d theta is the same thing as 2 times sine squared minus cosine squared minus sine theta, but the sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta is the same thing as a negative cosine of 2 theta, which is exactly what we got here. All right, so now we saw both approaches. Now let's actually go ahead and figure out, okay, well, what would be the dy dx? Well, for the dy dx, I got the following. On our numerator, I factor out a 2. So it's 2 times cosine theta minus 2 sine theta cosine theta, which again, we could simplify if we wanted to. And on the denominator here, we got a negative 2 times sine theta plus cosine of 2 theta. Now, we can just go ahead and cancel the 2s here. And our final answer should be a negative, this negative right here, times cosine theta minus sine 2 theta on the numerator divided by sine theta plus cosine of 2 theta. And there we go. Now, notice again here that I did use the trig identity. This here is the same thing as sine 2 theta. All right, so now that we have an equation for the slope, and you want to y dx here, let's see if we can write down the equation for the tangent line to the curve when theta is equals to pi. All right, so now remember, since we're going to be writing here an equation for the tangent line, we know that the equation for a line is the same thing as y minus y1 is equals to m times x minus x1. Or alternatively, if we're going to be using function notation, then we're going to have f of x minus f of x1 is equals to f prime at x1 times x minus x1. Now, at this point, we have everything that we need. Now, it might not seem like it, but we do. So we know that we're looking for a tangent line to the curve at theta is equals to pi. So if we know that theta is equals to pi, we can go ahead and figure out, okay, what will be the corresponding x and y value when theta is equals to pi? And I'm going to go ahead and begin here with the x1, which is equals to our x function as a function of theta evaluated at pi, which should give us here a 2 cosine of pi minus 2 sine of 2 pi. 
the sine of 2 pi is 0, so we just have a 2 times cosine of pi, but the cosine of pi is negative 1, so we should just be getting a negative 2. Now for our y1, which again is just the y function evaluated, at the, fun the y function is a function of theta evaluated at pi, so let's just put here y of pi, and this one here is going to be equals to 2 times sine of pi minus 2 sine squared of pi, which is just a 0. All right, so here's our x1 and our y1. Now, all that we need to figure out is, okay, well, what is the derivative evaluated at x1? Now, the thing is, though, that we don't really know the derivative as a function of x, but we do know the derivative as a function of theta. So I'll just put here that the derivative is just going to be the same thing as our dy dx evaluated at theta equals to pi. So I'll do this here. So it's going to be a negative times the cosine of pi minus sine of 2 pi over sine of pi plus cosine of 2 pi. All right, so we're going to have here a negative. Now the cosine of pi is a negative 1. Sine of 2 pi is 0 divided by sine of pi, which is 0. Put here 0 plus cosine of 2 pi, which is now 1. All right, so it seems like our derivative evaluated at pi is simply equals to just 1. All right, so now we have everything that we need. Now putting everything together, we're going to have y minus our y1, which was 0, is equals to our slope, which was 1, times x minus a negative 2, which gives us simply y equals to x plus 2. And there we go. Now we figure out, okay, the tangent line, or the equation for the tangent line at theta equals to pi, is the line x plus 2. All right, now for part f, we're being asked to find out, okay, well, are there any points for vertical tangency? Now, what does it mean to have vertical tangency? Well, remember, vertical tangency, it just means that your slope is undefined. Now, for a particular derivative function, this one here could only be undefined when the denominator is zero. So let's go ahead and take a look at our denominator and set it equal to zero to see what we get. So in our problem, our denominator was the sine of theta plus the cosine of two theta, and we're setting this one here equal to zero. And I'll just put here denominator equal to zero when it, whenever the derivative is undefined. All right, so we're setting our denominator equal to zero here, but we ran into a little bit of a problem because, well, now we're essentially solving a trigonometric equation, but when we're solving trigonometric equations, if we can't, we do have, or we do want to have the equations in terms of the same trig function. Right now I have a sine theta and a cosine of two theta. So what I'll do for this one here is I'm gonna go ahead and use a trig identity because I know that the cosine of two theta is the same thing as one minus two sine squared theta. Now, what if we don't remember the identities? Well, now, if you don't remember the identities, then I would consider this one here a drawback of what we did before, of first taking our x and y functions and rewriting them in terms of theta to take the derivative. If we went ahead and do this, well, I guess it won't necessarily be a drawback, but using the identities would have been a drawback because you could have also just taken the derivative of x, but instead of writing the two sine theta, cosine theta here as sine to theta, you could have used instead the product rule. If you did the product rule, we would have gotten this expression that I've got here using the longer approach, the sine squared minus cosine squared minus sine theta. You could have used that, and unfortunately though, it wouldn't have been as easy, because then if you use the sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta, if you want to go ahead and set this equation here equal to zero, you still have a cosine squared which would, you would still need to use the Pythagorean identity to rewrite it in terms of sine squared. So for this one here, guys, since this is the last topic and on the last exam, I will be providing you guys a cheat sheet with some of the most common trigonometric identities so you can use them to have them at your disposal to simplify your math here. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead and keep on using the 1 minus 2 sine squared theta because this one here is, again, a, an identity that will save us a ton of work here. Not a ton of work, but it will save us some work. All right, so let's see. What do we get then if we substitute in the one minus two sine squared theta for the cosine of two theta? Well, this is gonna give us then a sine theta plus one minus two sine squared theta, which I'll go ahead and simplify here or rewrite so that I'll put it equal to zero. Then I'm gonna go ahead and rewrite it because I don't like having a negative for the sine squared. So this one here is gonna be a two sine squared theta minus sine theta minus one. Now, lucky for us, this one here could be factored. So if we factor this one, we're going to get a 2 sine theta plus 1 times sine theta minus 1 equal to 0. All righty. Now, at this point here, we can just go ahead and set each individual factor equal to 0. And this is going to give us the following. Now, 
continue. Let me just continue rearranging this one here a little bit more. There we go. So for the first factor, I'll put this one here in. This one is going to be 2 sine theta plus 1 is equal to 0. And the other factor here, sine of theta minus 1 equal to 0. Solving this one here, we're going to get sine theta is equals to 1. Now, since we said that our angles were restricted to be between 0 and 2 pi, the only value for theta that gives me a sine value of 1 is the pi over 2. Okay, so solving the other factor, we have sine of theta is equals to negative 1 half. And again, on the interval from 0 to 2 pi, the only values for theta that give us a sine value of negative 1 half are 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. Now, at this point here, guys, I'm going to give you a warning. It might seem like we're done because we figure out what values of theta make the denominator equal to 0. And that is true. These values of theta make the denominator equal to 0. However, you have to be careful because what happens if the numerator is also 0 for any of these values? Well, something else is going to happen. Now, for this one here, I would just rather show you the graphs so you can see it visually. So let's go back to our calculator and our graph. Now for this one, I'm going to change the window a little bit. I'm going to say that my window, let's go for values of negative 4 and 4 for our x's. Our y's, let's go for a y min, let's go for negative 5. And for our y max, let's just go to 2 here. Okay. Now taking a look at the graph. All right. So let's see what's going to happen if I select a value for theta and let's go for the 7 pi over 6 first. So I'm just going to go hit, hit, I'm just going to go ahead and click on trace here. And I'll say, okay, well, what is the value in the function when pi or theta is 7 pi over 6? So let's see. All right. So you see here that at 7 pi over 6, if you picture a tangent line, it does seem to be vertical. So that's good. This one checks out. Now let's go ahead and click here on trace and see what happens now at the 11 pi over 6. Okay, now at the 11 pi over 6, okay. So it does seem like if I were to draw a tangent line, it is also vertical. So now let's check the last one. Now the last one here at pi over 2, click here on trace and select the pi over 2, click on enter. Now, mm, you see here that at pi over 2, you're not really getting a vertical tangent line. I mean, you could, but you could also get a horizontal tangent line because at that point, you're actually dealing with a cusp. So whenever both your numerator and denominator are equal to zero, you don't have a point of vertical tangency. Instead, you have a sharp corner. You have a cusp. So let me go back to the notes here, and I'll mention this. If the numerator and denominator are equal to zero, you have a cusp. All right, so with that said, we're done with the problem. The points for vertical tangency, or the vertical tangents, they were given at the following theta values, 7 pi over 6 and 11 pi over 6. However, the cusps were at the values of theta, or the lone value of theta, of pi over 2. And there we go. All right, so I think this is where we're going to be stopping here. And we'll continue on with our lecture in part two. See you guys there.